let us get started. Um, so hello everybody and thank you so much and welcome to the seminar which is organised by the Oxford Business and Human Rights Research Network. We are also known as OxBHR, which is part of the Bonavero Human Rights Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, my name is Lisa Sim and along with my colleague Katarina Rostova, who's also working hard behind the scenes, um, we are the conveners of OxBHR and I will be chairing today's session. I'm so delighted to introduce Russell Hopkins, um, who's with us today. Russell is a barrister in the independent practice at Bright Line Law in London. Uh, he specializes in the liability of corporate actors for international human rights violations in both human, uh, civil and criminal law. He has a wealth of experience in this area, including as an expert legal advisor to the Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Cambodia, as a contributor to the Council of Europe's manual on the liability of legal persons in corruption offences and advisor to the Global Legal Action Network. And for those of you who um, are interested in further reading from Russell today, following today's talk, um, Russell's authored a, a chapter in a forthcoming collection on the international criminal responsibility of wars, funders and profiteers, in which he evaluates the disjointed web of corporate criminal liability in England and Wales. Um, Thank you so much, Russell, for joining us today. But before we kick off, um, I just want to outline briefly the order of events. Um, so we will hear from Russell for about 30 to 35 minutes. Um, we ask you to keep your camera and your microphone off at this time. Um, communicate with us um, through the chat function if you have any queries. Um, following Russell's presentation, uh, you, the participants, will have some time to ask questions and we ask you to type your name into the chat to indicate that you would like to ask a question so it ensures that we've got the right order and when I do call your name to indicate your turn please turn on your mic uh, to ask the question and finally when Russell has his slides up um, we recommend that you use the side-by-side -side function which is on the top of your screen if you click on view options um, you can click on side-by-side -side, um, so that you can see Russell as he's speaking and presenting um, his slides to you. So um, I think the mundane details are now covered um, so Russell um, thank you so much again for being with us and please the floor is now yours. Thank you uh, Lisa C can you hear me okay? Yes well, th thank you, and um, thank you to the Bonavero Institute for inviting uh, me to talk to you um, this afternoon about criminalising corporate conduct. It's a, a thrill for me um, to be given this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon about what I think is one of the most fascinating and, and uh, quite difficult uh, legal questions of all, and that really is, can corporate actors, uh, in particular legal persons, be prosecuted for their involvement in international crimes? If not, why not? Should they be? And uh, conceptually, does it, does it work? Practically, is it even necessary? What do we think would be achieved by prosecuting a company, say for um, genocide or crimes against humanity, in addition to prosecuting the individuals involved? What is gained by trying to convict a, a cement company like Lafarge um, in France of crimes against humanity um, committed in Syria, in, in addition to the individuals in, in, involved? Should arms companies um, be liable for war crimes uh, committed overseas using uh, their weapons? Does a, a social media company, for example, aid and abet uh, genocide? Um, if it becomes a platform for unchallenged hate speech. And, and then if we go all the way back to the, the Nuremberg judgment of 1946, it was, was that judgment right when it said um, that international cri crimes are committed by men, not by abstract entities? Well, I'll, I'll start by telling you my, my own view. I think there are um, good reasons why, in, in the right case, legal persons um, should be prosecuted for international crimes. But uh, what is still needed, uh, and I think um, lacking, is a coherent model of um, attribution um, to, the, to the legal person and also a coherent model of criminal sanction. More work is needed on both those fronts. 
And, and if you take one thing away from, from today, um, I, I would suggest to you that it is the, the, the ongoing need really to develop a fair and appropriate model of attribution to legal persons, especially if we think about uh, modern corporate structures where there can be dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands um, of different legal entities set up in, in various jurisdictions, often for tax reasons all over the world and all part of a, a massive um, corporate group. So I, I'm not, I'm obviously not making a, a, an original point here. Um, it, it's a well-worn debate. Um, it goes back hundreds of years. Um, it, was, it was even said about the East India Company and the quote there is on, on your, your slide that corporations have neither bodies to be punished nor souls to be condemned. They therefore do as they like. And, and some of those conceptual challenges for corporate criminal liability are still, I think, um, posing us some difficulties today. And it's until they're really grappled with and resolved that the, the idea of prosecuting a, a company, a legal person, for international crimes like genocide, crimes against humanity, and so on, um, is, is, is probably still quite ambitious. Um, it is, however, a, seems to me a, a, a good time um, to reflect on criminalising corporate conduct. A it's a timely topic um, and I'd suggest there's three reasons for, for, for that or I'll give you three reasons for that. Firstly, um, a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday morning, um, Felician Buga, uh, Kabuga, an alleged genocidaire, um, a long-time fugitive from the Rwanda tribunal, was arrested in Paris um, now, as many of you will know, um, the, the allegations against him um, relate, or many of the allegations against him relate to financial transactions and the um, establishment and management of a radio station, or RTLM. Now, should, should his trial go ahead, um, it does seem set to explore the ways in which um, financial transactions, corporate structures and so on are, are um, intermeshed um, with some of the most serious crimes of violence. And, and this will, I think, be a, a um, to the majority of trials that the ICTR heard, for example, which um, for, for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, um, focused on um, political and, and uh, military figures rather, rather than um, um, those in the economic, uh, economic actors. A second reason why I think it's a timely um, topic is I do just want to mention the um, horrible killing of George Floyd in, in, in the US in Minneapolis last, last Monday. And one point um, that it seems to me arises from a, a case uh, like that is really the scourge of um, systemic um, racism, which reaches um, beyond the, the actions of an individual uh, officer. Um, or even the, the officers who, who were seen in the video um, looking on. Now, what, what, does that, what does that have to do with um, corporate liability? And, and clearly there's, there's um, broader societal uh, issues at stake there. Um, but the reason I, I, I would suggest that, that there is something of a parallel to think about is that it does, a case like that does make us um, look beyond the acts of an individual um, accused to think about the background of systems, of structures, of biases, of policies in which individuals um, themselves act. And it's that um, cumulative effect, if I can put it like that, and, and context, which, which also comes up in, in many of the debates when you're thinking about criminalising corporate conduct uh, and, and the liability of the, the legal person as well, points like corporate culture and so on crop up um, and um, it not being just a, a few bad apples, for, for example. Um, a third reason why this is, I think, a timely topic um, is that a couple of months ago, uh, the, um, some senior executives from um, Barclays Bank and um, the trial against them um, collapsed and they were charged with, with crimes to do with their, uh, their, conduct, their conduct during the 2008 financial crisis. Um, now, the crucial point for, for now is that the bank and um, the legal person was, was also acquitted. 
the charges against it had been dismissed much earlier, back in 2018. Um, but those judgments acquitting the bank um, were, were only released when the cases against the individuals um, um, finished just a couple of months ago. And there is um, a long first instance judgment from Mr. Justice Jay from May 2018. There's then an, an appeal judgment from Lord Justice Davis um, from later that year, November um, 2018. And, and these judgments, both of them, um, uh, really uh, get into and address the, the well-worn debate as about the identification doctrine in English um, law, which I'll come back to later. Um, but I, I do just want to read you very briefly a, a, a short passage from um, Lord Justice Davis's judgment, because it, it does, I think, shine a light on um, some of the issues that we need to, to grapple with. And he said, paragraph 102 of his judgment, he said, the question um, can be usefully be asked as to why the corporation in question is to be the subject of criminal prosecution. I asked the SFO, the Serious Fraud Office, that question here. Uh, Barclays is currently the subject of a regulatory investigation. It has also, I gather, been served with civil proceedings for financial redress by aggrieved parties claiming to have suffered loss as a result of what's occurred. Yet further, the individuals within Barclays itself um, said to have been responsible for what has happened are the subject of ongoing criminal prosecution. So why prosecute Barclays itself? The, the more so, perhaps, when if there were a conviction, the resultant presumably heavy fine would in practice be borne by the innocent shareholders. The answer I was given was that it was to promote deterrence and good corporate governance. And the judge then goes on to reject those um, effectively policy reasons um, for, for um, corporate criminal liability and for those fraud um, charges that were levied against Barclays. And, and he said that, um, well, holding that it really was open to Parliament to draft specifically specific statutory offences for the corporates um, to achieve those um, public policy objectives. And he, he gives the example of um, uh, health and safety legislation, where there are many strict liability offences that can apply to, to corporates for public policy reasons. Um, but I, I mentioned the collapse of the Barclays trial um, because I, I think um, it will give further impetus um, to those who contend that legislative amendments are needed in the UK. Um, the focus in that case, of course, was on economic crimes. Um, there are um, calls uh, for, uh, to, to look also to human rights abuses and other crimes more generally, and the uh, sometimes um, pathological, I guess, um, um, corporate structures that can influence and, and enable, in certain circumstances, individual wrongdoing. Okay, um, so moving on, I, I will come to um, consider some of the international developments. I'll spend a bit of time um, on the position in the UK. I'll look at, in particular, at how the um, Rome Statute is incorporated into UK domestic law and some of the, the challenges that UK prosecutors face. And then I'll outline um, what I see as some potential um, solutions um, uh, or, or alternatives. But before I dive into that, I want to tell you about some research that I've been doing about that famous line from the, the Nuremberg judgment. And that famous line is, of course, that crimes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract entities. It's only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes that the provisions of international law can be enforced. Now, I want to tell this story for, for two reasons. Um, first, I, I think it, cast, it will cast um, some light on the relevance of domestic law. Um, and practice when interpreting international judgments, especially on the um, vexed question of corporate criminal liability. Um, secondly, um, I, I, I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, it's an investigation that I'm still undertaking and I'm, I'm hopeful that um, um, others on, on joining us might be able to shed some further light on it. Um, Anyway, that, that line from the Nuremberg Judgment, it, it's such an important line because it is sometimes said that corporations are abstract entities, legal fictions, and that the um, ire of international criminal justice is really best focused on, on individuals. And it's a line that's 
frequently repeated. It's debated in the scholarly literature um, that discusses corporate criminal liability for international crime. So it's an important line. Um, it even uh, found its way into the uh, International Law Commission's commentary um, to the Nuremberg principles that were adopted um, shortly after um, the Nuremberg trial. So we might pause then um, to ask ourselves, well, who wrote it? And what did they mean? Um, well, the, the International Military Tribunal was composed of eight judges, all men, um, two from each of the UK, the US, France and the Soviet Union. And according to one account of the um, Nuremberg trial written by Anne and John Tussa, you saw their book, book on the, the previous slide, um, Norman Burkett, uh, one of the British judges, took the lead drafting the judgment um, and he'd been asked to, to do so by the, the presiding judge, Lord Justice Lawrence, who was also a British judge. Um, so if, if Mr Justice Burkett, as he then was, if, if he wrote it, could he really have meant to say that it is only by punishing individuals that the provisions of international law can be enforced? Um, well, um, there is a biography of Mr Justice Burkett available, which I, I looked at, and um, there's not really much on, on point in there. Um, nor if, if we look through, um, if we do a search on Westlaw or Lexis or whatever, at the cases that he decided as a, a domestic judge, and he eventually ended up in the, the House of Lords, um, do, do you find much there? Um, but interestingly, when you read his bi the biography of him, um, it describes how he actually came to the bench very, very late, relatively late in life. He was a very successful um, advocate at the bar. Um, I, and so I, I then went and did some searches to see what cases he'd acted on as, a, as an advocate before he became a judge. Um, and one case jumps out from about 20 years before, before he went to Nuremberg. And it's the case of the Crown against um, Corey Brothers and Company Limited. So some 90 years ago now, and Norman Burkett, King's Counsel, um, acted for the company. The company had been um, charged with, with the, the death um, for, for setting up and causing to set up a trap um, whereby trespassers who, who went onto the company property would be um, caught and, and, and injured in the trap. Um, now, the, the law report records Mr. Burkett King's Council's submission that, um, and, and it's on your slide, uh, a corporation manifestly cannot be indicted for murder as the only punishment for that crime is, is death, as it was at the time. Uh, he, he further submitted um, that although a corporation could be indicted for breach of a duty, it cannot be indicted for offences against the person. He submitted that the mens rea cannot be present in the case of an artificial entity like a corporation. Now, interestingly, the court accepted Mr. Burkett's submission. It observed, um, the judge said, it may be that the law ought to be altered, um, but the judge concluded that the authorities showed quite clearly that an indict indictment couldn't lie against a company um, for these types of charges. And the, judge, the judgment concludes, I must decide that Mr. Burkett's objection is a good one, and a company cannot be indicted. Now that's interesting, I'd suggest, on uh, two fronts. Firstly, 90 years later, um, there is an offence of, a statutory offence of corporate manslaughter now, of course, but, but we are having many of the same types of discussions still about whether and if so how the law ought to be altered. And secondly, a second reason why I think this is quite interesting is, uh, does it tend to show that um, Norman Burkett's domestic experience coloured his subsequent um, pronouncement in an international judgment of great consequence? Now, all that's uh, a bit circumstantial, maybe, um, so far. So we go back to look at the Nuremberg judgment itself and examine it in a bit more detail. Now, the, the statement in the judgment, that important line um, about um, abstract entities. It, it's about 50 pages in to a 220 odd page judgment and it appears in a section entitled the law of the charter. 
um, it's the section discussing the tribun international military tribunal's jurisdiction. And the statement about crimes being committed by men, not by abstract entities, it's, it's expressed when you read it, it's expressed as a direct answer to a defence submission that international law was, they said, uh, concerned only with the actions of sovereign states um, and, and provided for no punishment for, for their individual clients that, 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 uh, who were on trial. The statement in the judgment is, is not directed towards the question of corporate liability at all, read in context. It's a much, much more focused point um, that arose in response to a particular defence submission. But another striking feature um, when you read that section of the judgment is that the paragraph immediately before um, that famous line cites an American case, um, a, 19, a recent American case, then recent American case of ex-party Karen. Um, now, I won't go into the, the, the details of ex-party Karen, it's probably a, a story for another day, but the obvious point is there's an American case um, so maybe um, our attention uh, should shift away from Norman Burkett. There is another twist to the ex parte Karen case. Um, it was a trial about um, German saboteurs who'd come into the, the US with the intent to cause explosions. And they were tried, um, uh, and six of them ultimately executed. Um, they were tried before a military commission you actually see this case, ex parte Karen, cited in a more recent US case law to do with Guantanamo. Um, so they were tried um, before a military co commission, um, uh, but they were prosecuted by a civilian. And that civilian um, was a man called Francis Biddle, um, who was the US Attorney General at the time. And he um, even argued the case uh, when it eventually went to the, the US Supreme Court. Now, the interesting thing about Francis Biddle is that he later becomes the United States' primary judge at Nuremberg. And when you look at the transcript from the day uh, the, the day that Nuremberg judgment was actually uh, delivered, it was delivered over a couple of days, but the day that this section of the judgment was delivered in September 1946, um, you find that it's actually Francis Biddle that reads out this section of the judgment. So starting to look maybe like um, Francis Biddle wrote this, this line, this famous line, rather than um, Burkitt. So I went off to look at um, Francis Biddle's autobiography, and there are some hints in there. Uh, when he comes to describe the Nuremberg judgment, he says that, well, um, Norman Burkitt wrote some of the historical sections of the judgment, yes, but it was, it was he, um, Biddle, who was responsible for the statement of the law he says. And then perhaps the, the clincher is um, that um, Mr. Biddle delivered a, a lecture shortly after the Nuremberg judgment when he made this very um, striking statement. He says, uh, uh, subsequently published in the, the Virginia Law Review, this, this lecture he gave, and he said, um, there is moral value in fixing responsibility in a field of anonymous irresponsibility. He then says, and this is the interesting bit, he says, a state, after all, like a corporation, is a fictitious body. And he then goes on to, to quote that famous line that it seems he probably wrote um, from the Nuremberg Judgment. But where does all that leave us? Um, three points, maybe. Um, it does seem that, that Biddle, uh, Francis Biddle wrote this line rather than judgment, uh, rather than um, uh, Norman Burkitt. Um, there is a suggestion in that um, subsequent article in front of you that Biddle equated states with corporations and he wanted to distinguish the fields of anonymous irresponsibility there from questions of um, individual criminal responsibility. But I have to say, second point, that that doesn't really sit well with uh, US domestic law um, where corporate criminal liability is, is well established, indeed as I understand it, um, more easily established in, in practice than in the UK. So I'd question whether Biddle in that, that line in front of you was really saying that there, you couldn't have corporate criminal liability. And then the third um, concluding point on this um, I, I would make is that read in context, really the Nuremberg judgment was not excluding corporate criminal liability 
um, at all. The, the question just wasn't before the court. But, um, I mean, I appreciate that's perhaps not the most satisfying of, um, of, of conclusions to the, the, the story. It leaves a bit of a sense of um, intellectual unfinished business, maybe. Um, but actually, I guess that sense of um, unfinished business it does apply to, to, to many analyses of corporate criminal liability, I would suggest, to international crimes, that sense that we're almost there. Um, but but not not fully. So enough about Nuremberg. Um, wh where does international criminal law stand today? I just want to make four quick points about international criminal law before coming on to speak about the position in the UK. Um, firstly, uh, corporate criminal liability was discussed um, when the ICC the Rome Statute was being negotiated. There was a French proposal, as is well known, to include legal persons within the personal jurisdiction of the ICC, but it didn't really get anywhere, um, both because of time constraints at Rome and also divergent approaches in different countries, in particular Germany. Um, so, so it didn't fly at Rome. Um, secondly, there have been developments to note at, um, relatively recent developments to note at internationalised tribunals like the STL, uh, the Lebanon Tribunal, uh, which extended the scope of liability for contempt, of course, and not, not one of the core crimes before the tribunal, but for contempt. And using the tribunal's inherent jurisdiction, it uh, wasn't provided for in the statutes, but in its inherent jurisdiction, it was held um, by an appeal chamber there um, that um, uh, corporations um, could be convicted of contempt by the STL. And a newspaper was subsequently convicted of contempt um, by the STL, a TV station was, was acquitted but the, in the first trial, but the newspaper um, was subsequently convicted and fined. Um, I would just say though that this STL decision is not really, I don't think, one of general um, wide application. U ultimately it turned on, it was heavily influenced by Lebanese domestic law. So it's so of, of limited weight, I would suggest. Um, the, the third recent relevant international development is the Malabo Protocol, if, if, particularly if it ever comes into force, which extends the jurisdiction of a proposed African Court of um, Justice to legal persons, including for international crimes. Um, and another short point perhaps just to mention while we're on it is that this protocol interestingly also foresees a, a mode of attribution um, to the legal person based on organisational features, um, organisational modes of liability that, that aggregate conduct from, from different parts of the legal person and knowledge um, uh, in order to attribute liability to the legal person, which is quite interesting. The, the fourth um, international development I would just highlight is the International Law Commission's draft articles for a Convention on Crimes Against Humanity. They contain a, a provision on uh, corporate liability, um, but it's something of a compromise um, uh, formulation, I would suggest. It doesn't make corporate criminal um, responsibility mandatory. Rather, it, it says um, that it's subject, it should be subject to the legal principles of the state. Um, liability can be criminal, civil or, or administrative. So that would leave it to the to the individual states if the convention ever comes in, into force um, to to choose. So it's still pretty caveated um, stuff. So I'm now going to um, segue into the UK's domestic position, and I'm, I will do that by drawing to your attention a comment that the UK actually made about the ILC's draft article on crimes against humanity that I just was mentioning um, on the previous slide. And, and the UK made this observation. It said, um, in the UK's view, it's unclear what the, what the draft article actually adds, the UK says. Um, those states that have liability for legal persons as a matter of course will likely allow such liability for legal crimes against humanity, liability for crimes against humanity, and so on. So they say, what, what does this add? Well, that's interesting because in one view, um, English law recognises um, corporate criminal liability as a matter of course. It is part of 
um, the general law, in, in, in general English criminal law. Um, and, and there is a, a theory um, that the UK therefore also has li corporate criminal liability for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and so on. Now, a quick little recap on the um, ICC Act um, in 2001 that incorporated the Rome Statute into UK domestic law in particular. Um, what that does, it, it creates domestic offences um, so that the, the UK authorities can prosecute ICC crimes that are committed either in, in, in the UK um, or committed overseas where they were committed by a UK national, a UK resident, so on, or a person subject to um, the service jurisdiction armed forces. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a sort of standard universal jurisdiction um, provision. It's, it's limited, it's restricted to UK nationals, residents and so on um, for offences committed overseas. But the, the, there is a theory that goes that even though the Rome statute, the ICC statute, only applied to natural persons, the French proposal having been rejected at Rome, um, that the incorporation of that Rome statute into UK domestic law um, which refers to persons in the statute, in the, in the ICC um, Act, refers to persons, and the theory goes, well, you then look to the Interpretation Act, um, which defines, which says, well, for statutes that refer to persons, unless the context suggests otherwise, um, persons means both uh, natural and legal persons. So the theory then goes, well, you've got almost like a springboard, um, that, that the incorporation of, of the Rome Statute into domestic law springs you into having um, uh, corporate criminal liability for the ICC uh, crimes. So that's the theory. I, I personally think there are significant difficulties with that theory in practice. Um, there are several, but I've highlighted three for you on this slide. Um, the first is that the preamble to the ICC Act is, is pretty clear. It says that the purpose of the Act is to give effect to the, the Rome Statute and provide for offences under domestic law, uh, which corresponds to offences within the jurisdiction of, of the court. So it's really trying to, it's mirroring the Rome, the Rome Statute, not, not some sort of springboard to legal, uh, personal liability. And the second difficulty is that when you look at the relevant sections, the definition of national and, and, and resident um, are not really geared towards legal persons at all, I would suggest. And then the third difficulty is the available penalties um, under the Act. They are essentially custodial. Um, they refer back to the um, comparable offences under domestic law, so murder, for example, where the mandatory sentence is life imprisonment. Um, so essentially custodial uh, punishments that just don't, don't apply, don't work to, to, with legal persons. But why, why then this theory, why this focus on the ICC Act? Um, I wonder, um, it might actually be fruitful to look to other statutes. Um, I've mentioned three old, older ones um, uh, before the ICC Act, um, where you also see reference to, to person. So if the argument in relation to the ICC worked at all, or if it had legs, then, then you, you may think about looking to those alternative statutes as well. Um, but I think a number of those would face the same difficulties that I just described in relation to the ICC Act. What is more fruitful, uh, a more fruitful area to look at, I would suggest, is there are particular acts, um, particular legislation, which does provide for corporate liability. And I've highlighted five um, there at the bottom of the slide, where you see particular specific provisions for corporate liability. And I'd suggest to you that th those are actually better places to look, um, not the, the core um, ICC crimes and, and some of the offences in, in, in these pieces of legislation, the Cluster Munitions Act, Chemical we Weapons Act and so on, um, will be linked to very serious criminality in, indeed, obviously. Okay, so the UK's directing uh, mind and will test, which I mentioned in, in the context of the beginning when I was discussing the Barclays case. I, I won't spend too long on this, 
Um, but the short point is that the English law does have a, an extremely restrictive approach to attributing criminal mental states um, to corporates. Um, civil law, civil litigation is very different where vicarious liability is well established. The criminal law is extremely restrictive. I've mentioned on that slide um, some of the main cases, including a Scottish um, case. Um, uh, Tesco supermarkets is still the leading case from 1972. Um, Lord Reid held there that the, the directing mind and will of a company means it's the board of directors, it's the, the top of the company, the managing director, perhaps some, some senior um, officers. And in, in recent years, the um, director of public prosecutions, um, the director of the, the serious fraud office, they've all um, expressed some frustration with the restrictiveness of um, the UK's um, identification doctrine. And, and the most recent example of that is indeed the, the, the Barclays judgment. Um, um, which I mentioned at the beginning. So the limitations imposed by the identification doctrine have prompted um, some, to su some, some significant changes to its particular areas of the criminal law in England over the last decade. And three examples are, are often put forward. The first is the Corporate Manslaughter Act, um, which does provide um, that a company can be liable of manslaughter if the way in which its activities um, were managed or organised had caused a person's death um, and it had amounted to a, a gross breach of a duty of, of care. So that's a significant change to, to the UK's um, legislative, legislative framework. But I would highlight um, that a major limitation to that act is, it, is its territorial jurisdiction is limited to, the deaths, to deaths in the UK. Um, the second example that's often given is the, the Bribery Act, Section 7, um, which pr provides for a, an offence of commercial organisations that fail to prevent bribery committed by employees, agents or even associated persons. And, and then that offence is subject to a defence of having adequate procedures in place. The corporate had it had adequate procedures in place to, to prevent bribery, even if they failed in practice, but if the procedures were adequate and deemed to be adequate, then um, that is a defence. Now that, interestingly, this offence um, has extraterritorial extra effect as well. And then the third example that's often given is the Criminal Finances Act, similar in some respects to the, to the Bribery Act, um, that it, it introduced offences of failing to prevent um, either domestic or, or overseas tax evasion. And so these um, failure to prevent models of criminal liability, sort of fixing liability subject to a defence of adequate procedures, um, they do really seem now to be where um, the, the focus is, is, is at. And the UK government is uh, consulting on extending this um, failure to prevent model um, to additional economic crimes. Um, we're waiting to see concrete proposals for what that might look like. There, there were um, proposals to extend this model to human rights violations more broadly. Um, there was a parliamentary committee um, on human rights um, several years ago now, which criticised the UK's legal framework, criticised the identification doctrine and suggested a um, failure to prevent model to human rights abuses. And uh, the government um, considered that report, considered that recommendation, and then gave a pretty terse um, response, just saying that they had no plans to legislate in that area. And that, that response, um, almost lack of interest, um, has been criticised. Um, uh, so Alice McDonald QC, for example, has, has said, that if companies can be placed under an obligation to prevent bribery or tax evasion, why not, why not um, gross human rights abuses? And there is obviously, I, I would suggest, considerable force in that criticism. Okay, so other ways then to catch, capture um, corporate involvement in atrocity crimes. So I've so far suggested that it seems quite un unlikely that UK domestic law provides for 
liability for genocide, war crimes, and so on. Uh, but even if I was wrong about that, wrong about uh, my, my um, the, the points I was making about the, the Rome Statutes incorporation into UK domestic law, the identification doctrine uh, still uh, presents a, a, an insurmountable hurdle. Um, it, it may be that some work could be done to fashion particular um, offences on a duty to prevent corporate involvement in atrocities, and that is an area that, that many are still looking at these days. But in the meantime, um, what I've done in this slide is just highlight some alternative ways that we might think about of, of how to capture corporate involvement in atrocities. And I'll highlight just maybe two or, or three um, in the time available. The first is money laundering offences, so the fourth one down on, on the slide. Something to think about there is that criminal property um, is defined broadly um, in, in the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 as benefit from criminal conduct. And laundering uh, criminal property potentially triggers liability um, for corporate uh, actors, including legal persons. Th there is still there the challenge of the identification doctrine for the, for the substantive money laundering offences. But if a company is, is in the regulated sector, financial sector, for example, um, there are positive duties um, to file suspicious activity reports. And, and some of these uh, reporting offences or money laundering offences linked to uh, corporate funding and, and profit, even from overseas um, atrocities, might be one alternative area um, to, to look at. And it's that link between, I suppose, run of the mill um, financial crimes um, and, and perhaps the more headline, headline grabbing offences like genocide and so on. It's that link um, that I think is actually a potential area to look at in a bit more detail. The, so that's one, one alternative. Another alternative, um, an underutilised area, I think, is that there are some corporate offences, when you look carefully, um, that actually have a broader mens rea test. So there are offences where the mens rea can, can sometimes be as broad as having a reasonable cause to suspect and then if the, the act goes ahead, then the criminal offence is, is committed. Now, there are, there are intricacies with the, the different um, offences, but one example is the Cluster Munitions Act, which I, which I mentioned a few slides back, includes this broad, broad mens rea test and specifically provides for corporate criminal liability. Other offences, you sometimes see them um, drafted in the relevant statute as being that where a person knows or ought to know um, uh, th then criminal liability can, can still ensue. Now, in some respects, these are almost objective um, mens rea tests can be a bit controversial when they're applied to individuals. But I do raise it as a, a, an interesting area to look at when it comes to legal persons and thinking about how corporates organise themselves and so on. Okay. Um, To conclude, so at, at the start I said, well, if, if you remember one thing um, from this presentation, it should be the need to develop a coherent model for attribution to corporates before we can really start um, uh, thinking about um, expecting prosecutions against legal persons for genocide, crimes against humanity and so on in this jurisdiction. But the, the title of this session was Criminalising Corporate Conduct. And so we've, we've zoomed out a bit to look at a few of the alternatives, um, alternative offences that, that may be relevant. And there are eye-watering estimates. Uh, one hears about the, 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 the sums of illicit money that are laundered through the UK every year. £90 billion pounds is mentioned, so more, more than that every year being laundered through the UK's financial system. Inevitably, some of that is linked to overseas human rights violations. And, well, I mean, to turn to the picture on, on your slide, where lawyers and, and uh, writers and academics were always told to avoid cliches, but um, I'm going to breach that uh, now. And that picture is, of course, of Al Capone. And we all know the cliche um, that Al Capone, Al Capone, well, in the end, he was convicted of tax evasion, not murder. <laughs> 
And I think there is a lesson there, despite it being a, a cliche, um, for those of us that are interested in criminalising corporate conduct associated with international crimes. There are all sorts of offences that corporates that are mixed up in um, overseas human rights abuses might commit. And some of them might be a lot easier to prosecute rather than say genocide. It might be that we should turn our attention and resources um, to these maybe more uh, mundane crimes for now uh, and then try to fix some responsibility on some of those abstract entities and the structures uh, that do facilitate and fuel international crimes. So thank you very much. <laughs>